Hi, Jake Williams from Edition InfoSec here. Wanted to chat a little bit today about emergency alert systems that we all depend on for public safety, um, as well as the cybersecurity around those alerting systems. Now, <clears throat> you may remember uh, almost two years ago, well, two years ago to the day, um, we had a, an incident in Hawaii um, where the government of Hawaii was testing <clears throat> their emergency alert system and accidentally uh, sent a test alert that used the words, this is not a drill um, to the public system. Now, obviously this is a mistake uh, and, and a pretty big one, right? Um, <clears throat> the words, this is not a drill, uh, basically says exactly that, it's, it's not a drill. Now, now the fact of the matter was, it was a drill. We, we can talk all day long about the advice, you know, the, uh, how, how advisable it was uh, or, or not uh, to use the words, this is not a drill, uh, when in fact it, it was a drill. Now, I understand this was not supposed to go out to the live system, um, but, but that would have been great defense in depth. But look, honestly, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Really, it's the fact that almost two years to the day, um, here on the 12th of January, uh, 2020, um, we have a, another incident here, this one not from the uh, state of Hawaii, this one from the government of Ontario, about the Pickering Nuclear Generation Station. And what happens here in Pickering, basically, is that <clears throat> basically a mass alert is sent out uh, early this morning, 7.25 a.m., uh, and it's not retracted for 106 minutes, right? So uh, basically an hour and 45 minutes later, uh, or hour and 46 minutes later, they, they finally go ahead and retract this. Now, if you note here, uh, the alert, uh, it, it is a little bit better. I mean, from a, a stress out kind of standpoint, I guess it's a little bit better uh, than the one from Hawaii that says, seek shelter now. This one says, hey, we've had an incident, but there's no radiation and there's no proactive stuff you need to do right now. But man, I'm telling you, like, I, I grew up in, in the shadow of the Cold War. I mean, I'm not old enough to have like duck and covered under my desk in case of, you know, a, a nuclear explosion. Um, but, uh, but, but again, definitely it was something that was on my mind uh, growing up, uh, mostly because of parents and teachers and, and, and lots of folks that, that lived through, uh, you know, the, the, the height of the Cold War uh, versus the, uh, you know, versus kind of the, I guess, the, the, the spinning down of, of the Cold War. Uh, but that said, uh, wow, right? Uh, I can imagine if I live within 10 kilometers or anywhere near the Pickering Nuclear Generation Station, um, I, I would be concerned. Um, as a matter of fact, this is not a hypothetical for me, right? Uh, you know, for, for those that aren't aware, uh, Rendition InfoSec is headquartered in Augusta, Georgia. I'm filming this from the Rendition office in Augusta, Georgia. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, for those that aren't aware, uh, one of the big businesses in the central Savannah River area, CSRA, um, is the Savannah River site, which is a, a nuclear power plant, um, as well as, uh, I guess they've done some weapons uh, stuff there in the past. And heck, you know what? I don't even know what goes on out there. I just know that there's a reactor, um, and, and I know that we live within a fallout zone for a, our headquarter within and live within a fallout zone for a reactor. Not not 10 kilometers close, but, but look, if I get this text, uh, one, I'm grabbing the bug out bag. Don't really care that much about this, uh, I, I am absolutely going to get out of Dodge. That's not a panic thing. Um, it's a continuity of operations thing, right? Uh, probably grabbing Hacky um, and uh, you know a couple of SOC analysts, and we are going mobile um, and uh, and moving Hacky. For those that aren't aware, is the uh, the Hacky McHack face. It's a rendition converted ambulance uh, that we use for uh, some on-site um, incident response, as, as, as well as uh, just as a. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, certainly uh, for, for continuity of operations type uh, type support. Um, so that said, uh, wow, right? Again, I can imagine this would be a pretty stressful uh, stressful event. Um, now, what, what's interesting here is that uh, you know obviously they're investigating um, is it human error uh, human error or not? Um, they said, hey, that's going to be part of our uh, part of our investigation. Um, and they're going to start looking at what protocols and additional procedures to put in place to make sure um, that everybody has confidence in the system. So look, this is part of a training exercise and parallels uh, the training exercise with the uh, basically that happened in Hawaii that led to something very similar occurring. Um, this is part of a disaster protocol. Now we talk in InfoSec a lot about disaster recovery programs or DRPs. Obviously, we have to exercise our DRPs. Can't tell you how often we go into the middle of an incident um, and drop in during an incident response with a client, uh, you know, usually new clients in this type of scenario uh, that I'm going to talk about here, when they haven't exercised their incident response plan. 
or their disaster recovery plan. And they go and they say, well, and by plan, I'm going to air quote here and plan. Very often those plans are a little bit dusty, sitting on a shelf, et cetera, and they haven't really tested these. So I'm super happy that we're testing the emergency alert system. I mean, crazy happy. I, but, but again, the this is not a test or this is not a drill, uh, you know, it, it may not be appropriate there from a communication standpoint. Obviously, again, part of a training exercise. Now, we need to do training exercises in InfoSec as well. One of the questions that we ask uh, very often is, uh, when should we perform those exercises? Now, this happened on a Sunday morning at 7.25 a.m. Is that the right time to perform an exercise like this? I mean, there is obviously, a po demonstrably, a possibility that you send out a false positive alert. Would we have handled this, or I say we, but, but would the government of Ontario handle this? It took them 106 minutes uh, to, uh, basically 106 minutes uh, from 7.25 to 9.11 a.m. Uh, to get that, uh, get that notification back out and to say, hey, this truly was a false positive. I, I don't know whether or not uh, during the middle of a workday would have been better. Um, I'm interested uh, about the time it took to generate that retraction notice. And in InfoSec, we obviously talk about mean time to response, mean time to remediation uh, during an incident. This is itself an incident, right? And make no mistake about that. Um, obviously, here they started testing the plan, but during the test, created an incident. We've seen that as well with disaster recovery plans, right? Where they say, hey, it's part of our DR plan, we're going to fail over to our hot site, right, uh, temporarily. They find out the hot site doesn't work, right, or something's broken at the hot site. Good to know because you still can fail back, right, unlike during an incident where, where maybe you can't. What time do you do that? <coughs> do you do it off peak hours? I know a lot of folks that do that. I can totally make an argument for that. I would say the first test probably should be off peak hours, right? Um, but, but then follow that up with the, do we need to test during peak hours? And the answer is, oh my gosh, definitely, right? Um, because we're, we're gonna have to exercise the DR plan uh, likely at some point during peak hours, should we know how it's going, you know, how our systems are gonna respond, yes. Um, that said, you definitely wanna have people in place ready to handle an incident during a test of your uh, disaster protocols, disaster systems, etc. I have a lot of questions about the 106 minutes that it took to retract the alert message because um, e even in the story here, which again I'll link in the uh, uh, link in the YouTube post here, um, even in the story they, they discuss and say, hey, you know, uh, we immediately knew it was a false positive. Well, if they immediately knew it was a false positive, like why wasn't there a retraction message, right? And, and I'm sure there was some discussion around the, do we need to retract this? Do we need to state uh, something here? You know, what's the, pardon the pun here, what's the fallout uh, from this bad message? Wow, that was not planned, but but anyway. Um, so so look, uh, that, that's a big one for us, right? Is 106 minutes too long to retract the alert message? Did we have appropriate staff in place? Now again, so far I, I'm paralleling this to InfoSec, but I wanna spin this directly into InfoSec because in the case of the Hawaii drill, we know for a fact that it was human error, right? I say a fact. As, as much as any reporting is going to come out about it, it was human error. And I'll tell you too, by the way, that in addition to it being human error, um, the UI, user interface, is actually to blame in, the, in that case, right? Um, a uh, picture of the user interface, diagram of the user interface, whatever, came out um, after the fact. And the UI was laid out in a way that it makes it way, way, way too easy um, for, a, uh, for an alert message to be sent. And, and this leads people, uh, led people early on to say, well, was it a hacker that did it, right? Maybe it, maybe it wasn't human error as a hacker. Now, up to this point, we have no indication that this Pickering example was a, uh, was a hacker. Uh, the fact that it took place during a scheduled test, right? We can confirm now, or at least the, the news is confirming here, um, that it was a scheduled test. Given that it's a scheduled test, I, I think it's pretty clear it's on a hacker. But let's talk about the cybersecurity of these alerting systems because, gosh, I mean, you know, obviously these can cause panic. There's no question these can cause panic, right? Um, and, and so if a hacker can get to one of these systems and send an alert, uh, you know, should, uh, or basically, you know, what controls do we have in place to, to prevent that from, from happening? What sort of cybersecurity measures should there be around this sort of alerting system? And, and obviously feel free to, uh, in, you know, in the comments, uh, comment and, and discuss, right? Uh, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, cybersecurity measures should be taken around this kind of alerting system. I've, I've had uh, some folks, you know, mention in the past, like when the Hawaii thing kicked off before we knew for sure whether or not it was a hacker. Some folks are like, oh, definitely multi-factor authentication, MFA, right? Well, 
hold on a second, what kind of MFA, right? Because if you're trying to push uh, one of these emergency alert messages, right? Um, in in any, I mean, look, if if the if there's public reporting already on an inbound missile or a nuclear event or whatever, um, I certainly don't want to rely on SMS. And look, for for lots and lots of reasons around SMS, I'm not going to debate the security of it uh, as an MFA tool. Um, but but then think about, I mean, Rendition's a Duo partner, so I'm going to use Duo as an example of a uh, you know of another another tool there. I don't want to have to wait for a push notification. I don't want the operator of the alerting system have to wait for a push notification or even fail back to a backup code when he or she decides to send that uh, basically to send that alert um, I want them to send that as quickly as possible right as, as tightly tied to um, the, the time that they intended to send it um, as as getting you know basically as quickly as possible for them to get that out um, so, so multi-factor kind of stands in the way of that and, and uh, I'm not saying that we should or shouldn't have it I'm saying as a consideration Right. Um, bear in mind, of course, this is a, uh, a a highly critical function. We need to both secure it uh, and ensure the integrity of the system, while simultaneously ensuring the availability of the system. All right. Um, obviously, some of the concerns we'll talk about here are, are very identical to healthcare. All right. Um, in, in healthcare, uh, for those that don't know, by the way, I used to be a paramedic. A lot of fine folks in InfoSec are, are former paramedics as well, um, but uh, haven't done that for many, many, many years. Um, but uh, but I'll mention that uh, you know in an emergency room, a lot of folks are kind of like, oh well, doctors. I mean, you gotta have a password definitely on your account, and and you definitely need to have a you know, shouldn't be able to get into the EHR, the electronic health record, and two factor, and the whole. I mean, man, when, when you're you know, covered in, in blood and spinal fluid and, and you name it, you know, your gloves and everything. Um, it is, you know, even doing a four digit pin on, on the iPad, let, let alone, you know, the uh, say iPad, tablet, whatever you happen to have there, um, you know, or the keyboard, uh, that, that that can be life and death, right? Um, and by the way, too, uh, well, yeah, whatever. Anyway, that, that stuff gets gross quick. I'll leave all that out. But, but I'll just mention that, uh, that again, um, you know, that's a place where a lot of security folks are, Pah! of course you can enter a four digit pin and it's like, Brother, until you've been in an emergency room, right, in a trauma center uh, like that, uh, basically walk a mile in someone else's shoes, kind of thing, right? Because uh, while I certainly want to protect confidentiality, um, you know, I want to protect integrity and availability of of that as well, and, and availability being key here, right? So, so I'm interested to know what kind of cybersecurity measures uh, you, you think should be around this kind of alerting system. Now, um, I had this conversation with somebody, uh, you know, very very early uh, yesterday. Um, and, uh, you know, basically as, as the news about this Pickering thing broke um, and uh, <clears throat> they suggested uh, that air gapped, air gap was the right solution. Hmm. And, and, and I thought about this for a minute and uh, it kind of sparked and, and we'll probably have some more talks about air gaps um, on this channel. Uh, air gap being the physically separating whatever the system is from the Internet. And that's a go to when we talk about industrial control systems high criticality systems, et cetera, um, you know, that don't immediately do transaction processing on the internet. Uh, air gap is kind of one of those security controls. Be like, yeah, j just air gap it. Now, listen, if you use the word just um, along with the word air gap, I, I guarantee you haven't done this before. There, there's just no way, right? Because um, <clears throat> one of the first questions I ask when we get into, uh, you know, networks and folks are like, oh yeah, yeah, it's air gapped, right? I'm like, oh, cool. How do you get patches in? And they're like, well, um, um, I'm like, okay, cool. Right? And then we walk through that process nine times out of 10, nine times, nine, 95 times out of 100, it's not really air gapped, right? I um, mean, when it is, uh, it's typhoid Mary walking USB sticks around, uh, USB thumb drives around, uh, which which could be just as bad, right? Um, so anyway, oh, and by the way, too, lacks all the central monitoring that, that, a, that a choke point would have, uh, you know, going in and out of the network. But meh. Anyway, so what about the air gap, right? Um, so I want to come over here and, and I posted a poll, uh, posted a poll on, on Twitter here um, and said, hey, almost two years ago to the day, kind of what we're talking about here, uh, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency sent a false positive alert uh, about inbound ballistic missiles. The alert wasn't caused by hackers, but security is still important. Today I learned this critical system is still not air gapped. Now, I want to be clear that I have no ties nor does rendition to the Hawaii Emergency, emergency Management Agency. We do not. Um, so, so I, it wasn't a case of me going or calling or phone a friend or, you know, giving up client data as if we would, right, kind of thing. Um, but uh, none of that. Um, logic tells me that this system is not air gapped. 
It can't be, all right? Um, it, it is targeting, uh, obviously, uh, has to communicate with cell phones. And whoever is pressing that button um, is uh, ultimately sending that data out, right? Uh, they, they, we are generating a message. They are saying, confirm, go, send that message, right? Um, you know, obviously, if it's getting to my cell phone, it cannot be air gap. Um, now, I have to note here that Twitter polls um, are, I mean, as even as polls in general have lots of problems, Twitter polls have way more than lots of problems. Um, and I'll mention here, there are a lot of problems with this one. In particular, sampling bias, right? Um, you should expect any poll that I do on Twitter um, to skew heavily to security, skew heavily to InfoSec professionals, um, or at least people that are security aware, because uh, that's largely who my following is. Now, I know we have lots of followers from lots of different areas, and and rock on. Uh, also, I only ran the poll for two hours, so you may not have seen this until it was done. But notice here, 50% uh, of the 428 votes, right? So 428 votes, 50% uh, uh, of those folks, uh, so 220, or 214, um, said that the system should be air gapped. I, I have to tell you that uh, that was a little bit disconcerting to me. Um, you know, that the, the number was that high. Um, I actually had a bet internally uh, about uh, about how many folks would answer uh, answer number one here, um, and it was nowhere near 50%, right? So uh, that said, uh, it does paint an interesting data point, right, of uh, basically, you know, what our perceptions are around air gaps. Now, um, if you actually answer this poll, <clears throat> because I had a discussion with somebody else uh, as the poll went live, um, basically said, when you say air gap, do you mean data diode? Um, and, and the answer there is, well, no, that, that's not an air, that's fundamentally not an air gap, right? A data diode is, is a data channel, right? Um, that uh, that passes, between, uh, passes between different security level networks. Some folks refer to those as cross-domain solutions. Um, although I think we, we, we've really kind of landed on data diode as the, as, as the big, uh, you know, kind of the go-to go -to phrasing there, right? 47% depends, said depends on threat model. Right? And, and I think that's probably the cop-out answer, and right? it's kind of the depends on your threat model. Um, but, but again, from a physical standpoint, um, unless you're considering a data diode to be an air gap, and, and, and largely in industry, I don't think that we've arrived there um, where, where we agree that a data diode is an air gap, that those things are, are fundamentally different, um, then, uh, th then, then no, I, I don't think it depends on your threat model either. Now, if you answer this poll, rock on. Um, you know, Again, I'm not knocking anybody here by any stretch. I, I think it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting data point around the perception of air gaps in our industry and how quickly we arrive or basically will point to those as kind of the coup de gras of, of, of security. Um, there are very, very few spaces in InfoSec where an air gap solution is actually the right solution. Right now, there are a few, admittedly, but they are few and far between, right? Very, very few and far between. Um, and so, <clears throat> Uh, basically here, uh, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, again, I just wanted to call out here, and again, it's probably time for a whole other discussion around air gaps, um, because, you know, for instance, uh, one of the questions that, uh, you know, when I was chatting with, the, with one of the folks here, um, and, and uh, Jedi Day uh, brought up one of, the, uh, one of the same points there, um, you know, he, he, basically it was the, when you say air gap, do, do you mean an air gap to the terminal where they typed this message, right? And, and even then, I kind of stepped back, and I thought for a minute, and thought, well, yeah, maybe that makes sense. And then I'll just send the, uh, basically they can type the message on this like kind of standalone terminal and then they could send it across a data diode and then, you know, or that's separated by the data diode and that sends it to the system that then broadcasts it to our cell phones. And then I thought, does that really increase our security? And and, and the answer there is no. I mean, if, if this thing gets sent, right, the message gets sent across the data diode along with the clear to send message on the other side of the data diode, clearly we are on the internet, demonstrably we're on the internet to be able to go transmit those messages to all the cell phones. So, so I'm kind of back to this mode of like, no, on the flip side, clearly we need some security around these. There's no question about that. I can picture a lot of damage that hackers could do. Uh, you know, hackers could do this, including market manipulation. Obviously, there's folks that would do it for lulls. Uh, from a national security standpoint, um, you know, I, I'm not going to start enumerating scenarios here because because badness. Um, but but look, uh, you know, there's a really good question here around the what sort of cybersecurity measures should there be around 
this kind of alerting system. Um, I, I even on the data diode side, right? Because this is a discussion again we had internally. Um, like I said, I mentioned uh, chatted with the Jedi Day and a couple others about it as well outside of rendition. Um, but it was a okay. Even if you sent that down, do you want the person typing at the data diode, or do you want? Or sorry, on the on this terminal on the other side of the data diode, um, or, or do you want them? you know, like able to go proof a message, right? Being like grab data, copy, paste. I mean, we've seen transposition errors in numerous cases, right? Where folks are typing is transposition error, meaning like a, uh, or transcription error. Uh, basically they're transposed a couple of numbers. Well, that could be critical too, right? Uh, I, I don't want that. I want copy and paste to be a thing, I, I think, uh, as I'm kind of thinking about this from a security standpoint, um, w which kind of takes away air gap in, in, in most scenarios here. Now I'm sure there's a couple of security zealots who will try to explain security architecture here and explain how, oh, certainly you could create this ridiculous web of, of diodes that, that would prevent uh, anybody from tampering with the message until it got to the point uh, of release authority um, and sending it out uh, via the phone and or to the phone um, and, and and neat I guess but but not realistic right uh, the the reality here is that we have to build usable cybersecurity solutions and and remember that every piece of complication every piece of security that we add to this this is an interesting spot here and parallels healthcare man almost a hundred percent we do a ton of work in healthcare by the way um, but uh, the you know, everything that you do from a security standpoint has a usability implication. Usability meaning availability implication. And every piece that you implement obviously has a potential to fail, right? We talk in uh, telco about five nines uptime. Um, every time you have a potential failure there, that is obviously concerning. Um, if this emergency alert system, any piece in the chain that you drive in for security has a failure, then we can't get the alert to those that need them. So, eek. This is a great spot where I'm bringing up some food for thought and I don't have an answer, right? I wish I did. Uh, unfortunately, in this scenario, uh, I don't have the best answer or any answer for that matter um, on this. Would love to know what you think about protecting this. So certainly, we can build a secure architecture um, and can weigh those risks and risk model, uh, sorry, threat model. I'm not sure that every emergency alert system is going to be the same as far as their risks, their threat, etc. cetera. Um, but, uh, but definitely, I can tell you for sure that air gap is, is, is not the solution here. And, and again, we'll, we'll come back around and talk uh, in a future episode here, a future video um, about air gap technologies, when air gap is more appropriate, when it's not, um, all that. But wanted to get this out for you and get some food for thought spinning. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and break away here. Jake Williams from Edition of Mosec, signing off.